to having to do with him. So I hope you are doing well. I wanted to talk about Reverend Adam Daniel Williams today. I want to talk about Reverend Adam Daniel Williams and, and, and ask the question, who, who was Martin Luther King's grandfather? Who was Martin Luther King's grandfather and why was he important? Why was he so significant? You know, a lot of times I read about and I've read about Martin Luther King and I read about, you know, important people, influences he had around people that were in college or people who were international figures, but you never really hear them talk about Reverend Adam Daniel Williams. And he was the man who really set the ground groundwork and laid the groundwork for Martin Luther King and for many of the things that Dr. King did. So we'll jump right into talking about it because he was a man who ends up being an important figure in Atlanta and helping to establish and start the growth of Ebenezer Baptist Church, which will be the home church of Martin Luther King. And he is somebody who whose activisms and who activism in his fight for voting rights and for equal rights was was really was really significant in Atlanta in the early part of the 1900s. And it becomes a, a, a growth, a crucible, if you will, the, the, the pot, if you will, that Martin Luther King ends up growing up in, in terms of the backdrop of why his family was so active. It had to do right here a lot with this man right here, Reverend Adam Daniel Williams. So we'll talk about him a little bit. Let's, let's kind of get into it. He was somebody, he was born in Georgia. And if you can take a look at this, I'll have a lot of this on my resources, blackandeducation.org. You'll find more about him with respect to that as well. But he was somebody who was joined in, born in Georgia. And he was born around 1863 or 1861. So thereabouts. And, and I'd love to kind of, I'd love to kind of read about these things and write about these things. And I also mentioned just really quickly, briefly, that I do have a new book. It's called The, the Adventures of Tahari Amen. It's available on the Kindle app. So if you get a chance to go to Amazon and take a look at that, I would greatly appreciate that. It's called The Adventures of Tahari Amen by Danita Smith. I really appreciate that. But let's, let's jump into Reverend Adam Daniel Williams. Let's talk about him a bit. So he is someone who was born in Georgia. He's born in Georgia. He claims the birthday of, of January 2nd, 1863. He celebrated that as his birthday. So obviously this is during the Civil War and during slavery, and many people didn't know exactly when they were born, right? So he was born either in 1863 or perhaps 1861 might have been his, his birthday. Um, but he claimed January 2nd, 1863. On instinct, he claimed January as, as his birthday. Now, January 2nd, 1863, as you know, is the day after the Emancipation Proclamation. And so he claimed that as his birthday, even though the Emancipation Proclamation was obviously in effect on January 1st, 1863, it did not mean that all people were free. Um, one, it didn't apply to places that were not in rebellion against the United States, like Kentucky or Maryland, places like that. But also it applied, as I mentioned, to places that were in rebellion, an active rebellion against the United States. And those places wouldn't have automatically just let people free, you know, if they didn't, if they didn't have to, you, know, you had to actually come and have the union army win the war and the war was still going on in 1863. So technically he would have been born in slavery. He would have been born enslaved at a time when slavery was still going on in Georgia. His mother and father were Willis and Lucretia. So they were, they were enslaved by a person by the last name of Williams. So you have Willis and Lucretia and they eventually take on the last name of Williams. They were enslaved by somebody with the last name of Williams. They end up they're enslaved. So his father is, is named Willis. His father is enslaved. His mother is enslaved. And his father becomes a preacher while he's enslaved. And as you know, there are black people who obviously took up preaching, especially, especially as you got further along in the 1800s, more and more people were allowing the people that they enslaved to begin to study the Bible in very limited ways or to preach in very limited ways, as long as it did not go against slavery, right? But his father you know, had something in him with respect to a love of freedom, a love of God, and a love of the gospel. And when Adam Daniel Williams was growing up, he respected, he looked at his father as being a very respectful person. He was, he looked up to his dad. And so his dad, as I mentioned, his name was Willis and Lucretia. And Willis would have been uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King's great grandfather, great grandfather and mother, Willis and Lucretia Williams. They, um, slavery ended up ending. They ended up going and living on a different person's, uh, area, if you will, a different person's farm or plantation. And Willis Williams died. Willis died in 1874. And so Reverend Adam Dunn would have still been a somewhat of a young man when his dad died. And he had, he kept with him an idea and a love of his father. He kept with him an idea and a love of, of preaching. And he looked up to his father. Imagine how important it is for a young person to be able to see somebody that they look up to, somebody that they can respect, somebody that they honor. And so he did that for his, his dad. He looked up to his dad and he wanted to become a preacher. He never knew that his desire to be like his father, to want to become a preacher would end up impacting and affecting his great, his grandson who would become one of the most famous preachers of all time. Most famous preachers in American history. 
but he wanted to become a preacher. And so he ended up as a child, he would go around as a young boy and preach at the funerals of, of local pets, pets that would die in the area. And the kids would bring you know, their dog or their cat to him and say, you know, could you give my, my dog a funeral? Could you give my cat a funeral? And he would preach. And it got to the point where, where the people really see he was a great preacher. He was a great speaker. He was a great orator. He was, he was mimicking his father, what he had heard his father do. He was mimicking some of the people he had heard and he began to fall in love with preaching. And as he got older, you know, he began to preach and he began to come like an itinerary preacher and he began to preach in the local area in Georgia. Now he was living in, in, in Plinfield, Georgia, in Greene County, outside of Atlanta, not in Atlanta, but in a rural part of Georgia. And he had to do many things to try to get a job, many things to try to eventually make, you know, work for himself. He was working in a sawmill um, at one point in time. And he had a, a horrible accident that cut off part of his thumb and only left him with a part of his thumb on his right hand. With that kind of disability, he wasn't able to do the same kind of work he was doing before, so he ended up doing even more preaching. And he ended up becoming a um, licensed preacher in 1888. So he's there in rural parts of Georgia. He's preaching. And if you have family like mine, that some people were from Georgia, you would have had the same dynamic taking place in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So you have people trying to make a living in, in a rural life, but also the cities are continuing to develop and to become bigger. So he's preaching around in the local areas in, um, in Georgia. He's becoming known and he gets a call a charge, a request from a, a church in Atlanta to come be the, the pastor there. It's called Springfield Baptist Church. They asked him to come to Atlanta to be the 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 pastor there. So here, Reverend Adam Daniel Williams, he he accepts it. He comes to Atlanta in eighteen in September of eighteen ninety three. So he comes in eighteen ninety three. A few short months after the following year, like in March the following year, he gets a call and he gets a request from Ebenezer Baptist Church, this place called Ebenezer Baptist Church, and they want him to come there and to be the pastor. So he resigned his position at the first church at Springfield Baptist, and he went over to Ebenezer. Now, when he went to Ebenezer, Ebenezer, as you know, would become, that's the church that would be the famous church that was Martin Luther King's home church, his family's church. That's the famous church. It is this man, his grandfather, who helped to build that church into what it became and what it is today. So it's this man who's doing that, and it's Dr. King's family's church. So he gets to Ebenezer, and when he starts in Ebenezer in like 1894, there are like seven members. There are like seven people <laughs> in the church, and they don't have a building. They don't have a place within which to worship. So he has a lot of work uh, to do for him, and he becomes, you know, he eventually becomes a very significant person in Georgia's history because this article right here I'll share with you is from the history of the Negro and his institutions by Adam B. Cal a. B. Caldwell written in 1917 and it basically says that no no history of, of the Negro in, in a black person in Georgia of black people in Georgia could be talked about without talking about this man imagine that this is Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King's grandfather. And this, this article, this book was written in 1917. So this is written before Martin Luther King is even born. So they don't know about Martin Luther King, obviously. And they're saying that no history about people in Georgia, black people in Georgia could be written without talking about him. He was a significant man. He made an impact in Atlanta and he made an impact in Georgia. So he gets to Ebenezer Baptist Church. He gets there around 1894. They're like maybe seven members. They do not have a church building. He begins to grow the congregation over, over a period of time from seven members to over 700 members eventually um, in, a, in a period of time it begins to grow as a church and he begins to do a, several things significant things he always wanted to be educated he always wanted to have an education and when he was younger he didn't have that offered to him in rural Georgia during reconstruction you know he's a child he's growing up during reconstruction if you want to see how the lives of black people how people were affected and it affected their children thereafter you can see it in this man's life he's a child during reconstruction he is not offered a lot of education in, in rural parts of Georgia he wants to learn his older sister because he has a family right not only his mother and father but he has a family his older sister helps him to some extent learn to read and things of that nature one of the places that they go to live after the after his father dies the children there also help him to learn to, to write a little bit but by the time he was even you know up until 30 years old or thereabouts he had not even had more than like three weeks of a formal education even though he wanted it because he had to go, he, he didn't have it offered to them, to him, and he had to go do things just to eat, to make his family eat. So imagine wanting to be educated, imagine wanting an education, imagine wanting to do more for yourself and to develop yourself in certain ways and not having that been offered to you. And one of the things this article talks about with him was that he was a great man because he wasn't afraid to try something new. 
he had a very vivid imagination. He said, so they said sometimes he had to curb his imagination because his vision was that strong. He had a vision for doing things. And so he decides um, to go to, when he gets to Atlanta, to go to the Atlanta Baptist College, which would become Morehouse College. And that's the same college that Dr. King, Martin Luther King would go to later on when he joins college early, uh, early as a teenager, he goes to college. It's Morehouse College. So he goes to Atlanta Baptist College before it becomes Morehouse College and he gets his certificate in theology. So he is continually pushing himself to do more and more and to be better. And so he then starts to become very active. So as Ebenezer starts to grow, one of the things they do is they set up an idea for a building fund. And they end up taking that the building that is on Auburn Avenue at the corner of Jackson and Auburn um, Avenue there in, in Atlanta. And they end up renovating a building there and turning that into what is Ebenezer Baptist Church. According to the article, that took some $25,000 at the time to do. It was a, a project that was costing $25,000, which was a lot of money in the early 1900s. But this man had a vision to take the these, these people in, in this church that was starting out with just 700 people and then it went to 400 and then eventually 700 people to do something big with that. He eventually also became, became president of the Atlanta Baptist Ministers Union. So he became a leader and a spokesperson for Baptist ministers in Atlanta as a part of the union. So he's growing up. And he's beginning to have an impact in Atlanta and his voice is beginning to be heard. But there's more things that happen than that. You think about Martin Luther King and, and I've heard people say things about Martin Luther King, about, you know, not nonviolence and pacifism as if he was weak or say things. You never know what went into somebody's past. You never know what kind of history their family had. You never know what happened in that home and what made that person what they are and types of things their family went through. So as we think about this in September of 18 of 1906, the very the, one of the most famous race wars and race massacres that took place took place in Atlanta, and Reverend Adam Daniel Williams would have been there. Martin Luther King's mother would have been born by this time. Martin Luther King's family was there in Atlanta when this happened, and nobody ever talks about that, right? And this this article is coming from from the morning historian is dating September of 1906, and you see it's talking about a race war. Now this race war. And this massacre, um, this happened, this was before Tulsa, Oklahoma, before Rosewood in 1923, before Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, before so many atrocities, but it was after Wilmington of 1898, after Memphis, after New Orleans of 1900, after other things that happened in New Orleans, it was after many things, but before some of the, the other ones that we talked about. So this is 1906. And some of the articles that I've read about this, this horrible race massacre and just killing that took place, mass killing, was that it was something that was not seen of, the likes of it was not seen of in all of American history. That was one of the, the articles that I read about it. That's, that's a quote from the article. It said, nothing like this has happened since the European came to the shores and met Native Americans. That's what they said in, in the, um, that's what they said in the article. They were saying this was an incredibly brutal and horrible war that took place and, and massacre that took place in Atlanta, 1906. It was September, it's 1906, Reverend Adam Daniel Williams, he's in Atlanta. He is a pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. He is growing the church. His family is there. He's growing his, his he tried to grow his family and his church. And out of all things are happening, many people are in Atlanta, it's not just him. This is affecting many people in Atlanta, obviously, and people who were killed. And so what was happening was the newspapers were reporting, the newspapers had erroneously reported that four white women, four Caucasian women had been attacked on the same day or the same period of time by Negro men, if you will, in Atlanta. That's what the article said. And that made white people in Atlanta upset. And it apparently came on the heels of other reports that white women, Caucasian women, had been attacked by Negro men a couple weeks earlier or a month earlier. And so people had this groundswell of, even though this information was erroneous being put, put out by the newspapers, had this groundswell of reaction. And so you have these mobs called, and you can see it talks right here, and it's, it says Negro assaults on white women was the cause. That's what they say, right? You know, as if there's a cause for, to, to kill people and to be lawless and, to, and to, to murder people, if there's a cause to murder people, right? So this is what they're saying. There's no cause to, to be going around the street murdering people. And this is, is what happened. So it says the angry mob attacked Negroes on the street and 15 are killed. It talked about Negro men and women were, were ridiculously and barbarically, ruthlessly torn from streetcars and attacked. Dead bodies lie on the pavement. This is not me. This is the article from the time saying how dead bodies were lying on the pavement. It talked about how black women and black men were on the streetcars doing nothing but going home that day. You know, when the riot started, when the, when the mob broke out and they're just going home from work. They had a, you know, long, honest day's work. They're riding on the streetcars. They're coming home and they stop the streetcars and they pull them off of the streetcars and they take bricks and clubs and beat them 
them to death, literally beat women and men, men and women to death, black people to death and leave their bodies on the street, lying there on the pavement. And they end up going to a certain area of the town or near Decatur Street where black people were, would congregate and attacking black people they could find on the street, just killing them. And, and, and as you mentioned, as I mentioned, this article says, you know, bodies are just laying on the, lying on the pavement. This was all in 1906 in Atlanta. And it ended up being that the militia was called out and some of the people, some of the people in, in the mob and mentions in this article would jeer and yell at the militia as they were coming to try to restore calm. And then apparently a torrential rain took like a, just a horrible like a rain just came down and ended up cooling some of the people that were out in the street and it kind of died down once the militia took over. But this was a, a, a riot that put obviously fear and horror in a lot of people's hearts. So imagine you being a woman riding on a street car coming home from work and people just come onto to the street car, pull you off of it and beat you, beat you in the head with a brick and a club and just kill you, spill your brains out there on the ground. And you, you're doing nothing. This, this is what happened. That's a horrible, disgusting thing to happen. And this was the character within which, you know, Reverend Adam Daniel Williams and people in Atlanta were living. This is the character that they were living on. This is the, the life and things that they were experiencing. And it wasn't just this because at this time, they also have things that came out of this riot. So by this time, he is a leader. He is someone seen as a leader in Atlanta. And he can do one of two things. Do you step up and try to fight against this? Or do you kind of kowtow? What do you do? Do you step up with respect to this? So there are a number of things. And he stepped up. He was somebody who became a voice for equal rights. He was somebody who became a voice for voting rights, just like his grandson would. He is setting the ground for, for how his family would respond to this, how his church would respond to this. He wasn't just a preacher who just said nothing, we'll do nothing. He was a preacher who was active and apparently left his mark on Atlanta and left his mark on his family. So not only this, that this takes place in this horrible, horrible race massacre to take place, but after this, there was a call that took place. And I'll kind of show you this as well. This particular article is coming out of the Fitzgerald Enterprise, and this is dated in August of 1908. And this article from the Fitzgerald Enterprise, which I'll put a copy of it on my study center on blackandeducation.org so you can see it. You have a, a copy of it, but you can look it up and see. After the, the race massacre, the murder that took place, the murders that took place in Atlanta in 1906, after those murders took place, there was a big groundswell amongst Caucasian people in Georgia who did not want black people to vote. And so we talk about the whole voting rights issue and what happened later on with the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s and why that came to place. This is an example of why. And Martin Luther King's grandfather was right in the thick of it, right? Right in the thick of it. So so this, this proclamation, the idea was in 1908, after that race massacre and killings in 1906 in Atlanta, people wanted changes to the Constitution of Georgia. This idea of black people voting, this idea of black people being you know, in charge or being able to be elected, of being able to have their own rights being put forth, they equated voting with this fictitious attacks on white women. That, that black people being able to vote, black men being able to vote and assume any type of representation or assume any type of authority in Georgia was leading to black people being insolent and attacking white women. This is what they believe. This is the craziness. You can read this in several different manifestations of this and talks about this. So Georgia proposed several changes to the, their constitution. And this is a public proclamation in this newspaper, the Fitzgerald Enterprise in August of 1908 saying what the proposals were to their constitution, which were, which were adopted. And the president, the, the, um, the governor, Hoke Smith, is making these proclamations as a part of what he was supposed to do as they make a change to the constitution. Several things talk about, and I'll, I'll read it to you so you can see it, so it's not just something that, that's just, you think I'm making this up, right? And, and this, as I mentioned, you can see right here, Hoke Smith is the governor who, is put, who, who puts this out in several newspapers because this is a part of the changing of the constitution and people are voted on it later on. And so it talks about here, and I can make this even a little bigger, so we can see this a little better. Maybe you can see that better on the screen there. It talks about different qualifications for what would make you a registered voter or an elector, being able to be qualified to be an elector, different qualifications. And one of those qualifications talks about all persons who have honorably served in the land or the naval forces of the United States in the Revolutionary War, in the War of 1812, or the War of Mexico, right? And then it talks about as we go up to the, the next part of it right here, or war with Native Americans, if you can see that up there, war with Native Americans, or in the, between the states, or in war with Spain, or who honorably serve, people who honorably served in the land or naval forces of the Confederate states. If you served in the Confederate Army, or the state of Georgia in the war between the states, in the Civil War, they're saying if you served honorably the, in the Confederate Army, and 
you supported, this was an army that was in active rebellion, active war against the United States of America, treat active war. If you serve army war, you'll be able to vote. Now, black people know, but if you were a Confederate soldier, you serve army against the United States, you're able to vote. This is how they do it. This, this was it. Or persons lawfully descended from those embraced in these um, cases enumerated before. So if you were a descendant of somebody who served in the Confederate army or one of the other armies, but who can serve, you could, you could vote. If you could say my granddaddy served in the Confederate army and you, were the, you, you could vote. My, my grandfather you know, wanted to fight against the United States and wanted to, to kill United States soldiers and to break away, and that makes you, that qualifies you according to Georgia's con- new constitution that was being developed and being adopted, being developed, um, that will qualify you to vote. So not only that, so imagine what that means for a black person, right? What they're saying to you and who they're, they're, they're pushing to vote. But not only that, think about what I was saying earlier about Adam Daniel Williams in his life, you know, wanting to, to do more with education and pushing himself to learn more, but despite, but not having those opportunities given to him as a young man. And as I mentioned, he was 30 years old before he was able even to get some of the education that he was trying to get one to get his whole life because he was born enslavement and his mother and father were enslaved. And because he didn't have those opportunities on reconstruction and growing up, but wanting to do that and the push against you having education. Imagine what we were saying with respect to his desire for education and what that would have meant for black people at this time in 1908. So it further says, and all persons who can correctly read the English language in, in the English language, any part of the constitution of the United States or of the state. And so you have to be able to read the constitution or any part of, of the Georgia state constitution and correctly write the same in English when read to them by one of the registrars uh, at, at all persons. And so basically it's saying, so not only would you have to read any portion of the United States Constitution or the Constitution of Georgia, this registrar, you imagine me a black person having family in Georgia, and I did have family in Georgia a long time ago who, who lived there, who might have been impacted by this. They were alive during this time living in Georgia. If they wanted to register, this would have been the rule. This would have been a law. They wanted to register to vote. Imagine you have a registrar and you're going to go register and the registrar pick any section, any of the most difficult section, any of the most challenging sections and says, you know, you have to be able to correctly read it and you don't have, and you don't have access to education. You can't get an education. You have to be able to correctly read it and you got to write it correctly. Now the registrar might not have been able to read very much themselves, might not have been able to write it themselves, but they had the information right in front of them and they could see whether or not you were writing and you spell something wrong or, or misspell anything and you can't vote. Imagine that. So when we talk about whether it was poll taxes or literacy tests, ridiculous literacy tests, or grandfather causes, like if my dad fought in the, fought, fought in the my granddad or my dad fought in the Confederate Army, see, I can automatically vote. This is right here in the Constitution of Georgia. This is exactly what, what Reverend Adam Daniel Wade, Martin Luther King's grandfather, was going through. That's what he was living under. That's what Martin Luther King's mother and father were living under. They were living under this Constitution and this type of, of mindset and environment in Georgia. In 19, and, and this is in 1908 that it went into effect. And so you end up having this literacy test right here, you know, being able to read the Constitution or the, the Georgia State Constitution and write it according to what the registrar said. And that registrar gave you any part, and that registrar would make the determination of whether or not you fit that, you fit that qualification, and they could just deny you. So imagine how many black people, how many African-American people were denied the ability to vote and understood that, one, not only if I went down there to vote could I be risking my life, but two, I was also going to be given these tests that they aren't given, you know. So, so you could have been someone else who not even gotten that type of test, and the registrar just, if you were a Caucasian person, and the registrar could have said, okay, you're good. That's usually what happened. Think about, think about not just, just think about years later in, in the 1960s and 1950s when, when Fannie Lou Haber went to go register to vote and how she registered to vote, tried to register to vote in Mississippi and ended up being arrested for her activities and ter- helping to register people to vote and beaten in jail, beaten to the point where she sustained internal injuries. And, and, and think about people like Megan Evers who were shot down. And I compare Fannie Lou Hamer's decades later, years later, trying to go vote in Mississippi and being beaten beaten savagely about that and losing her job in, in, her, in, in her, as a sharecropper, working on a sharecropping plantation because she wanted to vote to Martin Luther King's grandfather and this particular constitution in Georgia in 1908, putting these types of laws in place. All the things for decades people had to go through and what they had to fight. So you could have a family who was taking away their education and, and said, here, you got to have to have, have to have an education in order to vote. But we're going to take it away from you. Or you know what? You go ahead and do this. Go ahead and try if you want to. You could be doing so with your life. 
you could be doing so like Fannie Lou Hamer, where you could be shot at or actually beaten and jailed and, and worse things happen to you. So this was the, the environment under which Reverend Adam Daniel Williams, Williams was living in Atlanta and he was wrong Atlanta and he was becoming a voice to speak out against this. He eventually helped to do things with the Georgia Equal Rights Commission. He was also part of the National Baptist Convention that took place there in the, in the 1890s, late 1890s. And he began to, to speak out and to speak out for voting rights. So not only was he president of the Atlanta Baptist Union and began to grow Ebenezer Baptist Church into what it would become today, the foundations of what it would become today, grow that church. He also helped to start the founding chapter, the, the, the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP. So he helped to found that in 1917. He was one of its founding members. And not only he became the president in 1918. And one of the things he did as a founding member and one of the presidents of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP was register people to vote. That's one of the major things he did was to put the whole voter registration um, thing in place. In doing that, he grew the membership of the Atlanta chapter of the NAACP very small to over 1,400 members in about five months. That's how dynamic he was. He was actually someone who stood up in a, in a, a national um, NAACP meeting at a national meeting, and he spoke before them to basically convince them and told them that they needed to bring their national meeting to the South, to Atlanta, because the NAACP was meeting up the North, and they weren't really addressing or being able to be in a place where so many other things were happening, such as was happening in the South. So he convinced the entire convention, apparently, at, at a national meeting to have have their first national meeting in the South, which took place in Atlanta in 1920. And so he was a, 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 a force. He was a, a, a formidable orator. He was, a, he was a force to be reckoned with. He ends up buying, he bought the house on Auburn Avenue at 501 Auburn Avenue where Dr. King would be born. He purchased that house. He bought that house with his wife, Jenny Celeste Parks. So he got married in 1899 to Jenny Celeste Parks. They end up having three daughters. Only one of their daughters, Alberta Christine, lived to be an adult. So unfortunately, she's the only one of their children who lived to be an adult. She would grow up to be Martin Luther King's mother. And what happened was he and his, his wife, Jenny, bought the home at 501 Auburn Avenue and they, you know, had their family in there and Alberta and Berta was there and they had their family there. Um, there was a gentleman, Alberta Christine would meet a gentleman called Michael King. She would meet Michael King. And the reason why, how she met Michael King, how Martin Luther King's mother and father met Michael King was born in a rural part, another part of Georgia, and he came to Atlanta to get a better life. He came to Atlanta to, to move forward as many people were at that time. And his sister ended up becoming a boarder, a boarder in the room, in a room at the house at Auburn Avenue that Reverend Adam Daniel was bought. So Michael King goes to Atlanta to be with his sister to kind of get better opportunities. His sister gets a room at Adam Daniel Williams' home in Auburn Avenue. And so he goes there and that's how he meets Reverend Adam Daniel Williams and his, and his daughter, Alberta. So Michael and Alberta fall in love. And Michael King becomes basically an apprentice. He becomes uh, under the wing of Reverend Adam Daniel Williams. He, he, he becomes a son-in-law. He becomes, they welcome him into the family. He becomes like an apprentice, like a, a, like a, a disciple, if you will. He becomes someone who's kind of following up under his wing and he's training him. And so that becomes a significant thing. Reverend Adam Daniel Williams lives for a period of time to see several of his grandchildren, including Dr. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, as you know, was born in 1929. Reverend Adam Daniel Williams died in 1931. So he would have met his famous grandson, but he would not have known that his grandson would have grown up to be one of the most famous and powerful preachers and powerful men in American history. And he helped to lay the groundwork of that. Not only did he grow Ebenezer Baptist Church, uh, he also helped to lay the found with the foundation and the groundwork for how Dr. Martin Luther King would grow up to be the man that he was. So I think as we talk about Dr. King and we celebrate his birthday and his national holiday, we should think about his grandfather. We should think about his mother. We should think about his family and not just his grandfather, his grandmother too as well. Jenny Celeste Parks and all that they did to help fight for freedom and for equality in Georgia and help to lay the groundwork for their grandson. So thank you so much for listening. God bless you. I hope you share this information with somebody. God bless you.